Jack them up, boys. Hey, it's good to have y'all. Welcome to Silverado Cowboy Church, where Jesus, King of the Cowboys, and everybody's welcome. The reason we say that is because we want you to know that God is no respecter of persons. And we are glad that you are here today. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, when we receive the word, it's Jesus called it the washing of the water of the word. Uh, Paul also later on talked about the washing of the water of the word. I want you to receive the word today and to be able to put it into your life and and make use of it. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God. A worker does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That rightly dividing the word of truth means where you apply it to your life. I want you to receive the word today, be able to apply it to your life, and remember that God loves you. I'll talk to you after this broadcast. Hallelujah. Youth and kids can be dismissed. Praise the Lord. So, um, Trista's rising to the occasion and doing children's ministry. So I saw her walk in the door and I was like, wow. Just never know. Everything changes, doesn't it? Hallelujah. I love how what David said, as, as, as God does. You ever notice how you'll hear something, maybe on the radio, you'll hear another minister, and then all of a sudden you'll hear it again? Somebody else will be talking about it, and then the Lord will be talking about it with somebody else, and how he just intertwines through our lives with a message. And I love that. And so um, a question I have for you this morning to, to think about and if anybody wants to uh, say something about it, I have a microphone up here. I know everybody don't jump at once uh, to do that, but uh, we'll go through the list. What's the last thing God told you to do? What's the last thing that God told you to do? Hallelujah. He told me to take care of myself. And I remember, I remember, I remember it very, very well, and it was about 13 years ago, and uh, I wasn't doing very good about taking care of myself, taking care of my body, and, um, you know, exercising, eating right, we were traveling a lot, um, so then I can go back, I don't remember how long we've been married, so we, we go through this every year, so 1994, when David and I, I believe, does that sound right? It sounds right. Anyway. So, we traveled in ministry, and so, you know, as we travel on the road doing ministry still, I get in the car, I mean, every truck stop, right? Bugles, soda pop, I don't drink pop, but I'll drink other stuff. You know, all kinds of nuts, Chex Mix, you know, and then, and then I, got, I got to stop every 100 miles. So, you know, and then Bucky's came along, right? So now I got like a vast array and I did, when I traveled with David last year a little bit, doing ministry on the road with him, I'm like, oh, mercy sakes alive. I, and, that, and I realized that, um, you know, I had a choice, though. And so when God told me uh, at that point, he said, long life is what you're promised, right? That's what the Bible says. The Bible says he promises us long life. David says he's living to be 120 years old. I'm like, okay. Well, he best be taking care of himself a little bit better, too, Mr. Simmons. I'm sure he's listening. And so, uh, um, and so I took it to heart, though, and I really did. I really started applying that, and I started eating better, and I started eating right, and I, I, I learned a lot about nutrition and taking care of my body, and I was exercising. And then the year before COVID, I just kind of stopped, and I haven't started since. And so, but it's behind me, that, that reminder, you know, about taking care of myself and how important it is. And so, within the word itself, this is, this is also how we take the best care of ourselves. Now, there's stuff we need to do physically, but spiritually, we need to be taking care of ourselves as well. And so, um, David and I were talking about this too. You know, we used to do daily devotions together, 
And we haven't done daily devotions together in, in quite a while. You know, and so the Lord reminded, reminded me of that a couple weeks ago when I was feeling under the weather. He says, I want you to get in the word. And you know, and my message today is, in the absence of the word is the world. In the absence of the word is the world. And we will make a difference. Amen? We're making a difference. And so that's why what David was talking about when he was talking about how God was looking for Adam. He went out and he looked for him when he was absent from him. And he knew he was. And um, in our mission statement... It, it states that is one of the reasons that we do the field ministry still to this day. We go out and we minister wherever the Lord will take us. And every day we all, right, minister wherever, wherever our life is. We should be ministering to people. And uh, if the word isn't going forth, the world's got a whole lot of options for them. As well as for us, if we're not careful. In Isaiah 48, 17 in the New King James, it says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. And so I always know that everything, every day, is to put the Lord first in everything that I do. And making sure that I am being led by him from just what time I should even get up as to, you know, what I should do when I go to work and who I can minister to. I'm going to share a, a, a very brief um, testimony of something that just, i got to see if i got tissue. I don't. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. So we have a young lady that came to work for us. And... Um, Friday, I was, the, the school's having their big Christmas party on Monday. And so I was baking cookies, and um, I had been under the weather, and so we hadn't been able to decorate the church at all. And um, I went up to the school, and I asked her if she'd come help, if she'd decorate the trees for me. And so she's just lit up like a Christmas tree. And she come down here, and she's 20. She's 20, 19, 20. And uh, she got done, and she says, you want to come look and see if I need to do anything else? And I came out, and she goes, you know, this is the first Christmas tree I've ever decorated. I've never been able to decorate with my mom. I guess her mom and dad, they'd got divorced when she was real young, and um, I don't know all the circumstances, but I was like, what a testimony. You, you, you know, you just don't know. You just don't know who you're going to interact with on a daily basis that they could be someone who's never really, I mean, we think about it because we talk about it all the time, right? Tell the simplest things, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that there's children out there who've never decorated a Christmas. I was just, it took me back. And it took me to my knees before the Lord, spiritually, to remind myself not to take anything for granted. Amen. Amen. The way that we should go. So back in 2015, Tanya was teaching a Friday night class. Parent, we used to have Friday night family night. And so she was ministering um, out of uh, Psalm 23. And I came across some notes. Miss Tanya did. And um, she was talking about, you know, how, how as parents, we are the first coach that our children ever have. And so, um, in the absence of the word is the world. And if we don't give our children the word, the world is there for them. And how important. It doesn't matter how old they are. Amen? My, my, oh, yeah, nobody's 40. Yes, they are. David's 40. Huh? Ha, <laughs> David, other David, big David, big David's not here, so uh, he's 40. So, you know, even just saying that, how old's your oldest daughter, Gloria? 43. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> she says she remembers when she was 43. So do I. Not when you were 43, but when I was 43. I might. So how old do you remember when you were 43? So <laughs> there are some people in here. <coughs> so... 
<clears throat> and, I, and I think about how I don't minister to my older children. This is, again, something that the Lord really, really brought to me is about reaching back out. Um, sometimes we take for granted that, you know, we, we, we trained our children up, but are they going the way they should be going? Are they, you know, when they're still needing to make decisions and they're not making really good decisions, we are still responsible to help them, I hope. God's still responsible to help us, isn't he? I hope, don't you hope so? Yeah, he made it, he made it his thing. And that's why I loved it when David said what he said about Adam. <clears throat> so, you know, um, anybody um, who is in management or if you have an employee that you work with, or it's your children, there is somebody every single day that we have an opportunity to be a life coach for, is how I was looking at it. Through the name of Jesus, right? Through God, through this word. This is the word that we're taking him. So when, when they're not making good decisions, and um, I had a new hire that um, called me yesterday, because I hired somebody on Friday, and she called, she says, so I read through the employee manual, and it says that I have to, I, I need to bring my church bulletin every single week to show you. She said, so she just moved here, and she hadn't found a home church yet. She said, does that mean I can't come work there? I said, no, <laughs> it doesn't. But what an amazing testimony that that, that was a concern of hers, that, that she knew that that was something that we established, that we want our employees, if you're ministering to our children, we want them to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And it's important to us. They're, they're, they're ministering to these, these little bodies of believers up there. Amen? And, and, hopeful, and ministering to the parents of those little bodies of believers. And so I, uh, I love that God has put us and given us the ability to mold and shape and be a part of 20 little, 23 25, whatever. If they're all there, it's 26 little lives. And um, I got a phone call from one of my 4-H students who uh, back in 2013 was part of the group. And um, they are now, they're turning 18. And she asked if I would encourage him. And so I went back through all my photos and I put together an album uh, of of, and, and testimonies on how he helped me and he, would, he started teaching and he was an officer in our 4-H group and, um, and I sent it over to him. What an honor to be a part of changing someone's life. And that's what his, his mom said. He said, he, she said, you changed his life. And I, you know, I don't, always, I don't always think about those things. You know, I do it because I love it and I love kids and I love giving them an opportunity for a healthier environment and activities that they can do through different programs in the community. And, but to have somebody tell me that I changed their child's life, it humbled me. It hum it's humbling. And I, isn't that a testimony we should all have? Amen? Testimony we should all have. But you know, if it wasn't for the word... I wouldn't be able to do it. Well, I might be able to, but I don't have to find that out. So, um, but it, because in absence of the word, the world would offer our young ones something else. God hasn't always been my coach in life. And so, um, you know, when we talk about parenting with a purpose and different classes that Tanya taught and in family night when she spoke about this, about the Lord's Prayer, um, I remember then and I made a note in my notes here that every day we make decisions for ourselves and others that can alter the very fabric of time. And we don't think about how our things we do affects so many people in so many different ways. We think that our choices just really, you know, they just make, it's just us, you know. When in many ways, being, sel <clears throat> being selfish um, and some of the things that, that I did early in my young life uh, were detrimental to my very existence. My mom thought that we should all just make up for ourselves. We didn't go to church. She just thought we should all decide for ourselves. That was not a very good coaching opportunity for some of my siblings or me and so she did 
She did not. Um, she did, though, help me understand that um, I should be self-sufficient. I should always um, be strong-willed, be a leader, right? right? And those things kind of sound good. But none of them were helpful to me when I started serving God, and God needed me to do something or let him do something because I thought it was just, it was all up to me. And so we talk about, I talk about this a lot. Are you one of those people who it's just easier to do it yourself than to recruit people to help you? When you delegate, you're giving God an opportunity for another person's life to grow and change. And I know sometimes, even, even at home, and so I know Heather, she's got littler ones now, and so do they have chores? Yeah. That's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, I listened to a lady on, on um, I don't know, it was Reels or something, you know, the Facebook posts, how they reel through, and she was talking about how important it is that we make sure that we give our children chores. And she's, she's going on. It was hilarious anyway. Um, because it molds them for responsibilities. And it's hard because they don't clean their room or they don't do what they want to do. And, you know, nowadays you're taking away phones and tablets and, you know, stuff like that. And so um, we have a little one we've been challenged with at school. And I talked to mom, by the way, so you'll know who, she'll know who I'm talking about. And mom says, you know what, we've tried everything. You know, and so we, we work with our parents. She says, I've tried everything. We've taken away toys. We've taken away television. We've taken away all these things. And we just, we're just at a loss. You know? Well, this was just Friday we had this conversation. So <laughs> do they stick with it? Possibly. Possibly, you know. He's four, okay? He's four. I always tell everybody it's not rocket science. We're just raising rocket scientists, right? Yeah. So, uh, but, but, you know, there are people in our lives that are challenging. Amen? I don't care how old you are. It, it might be your spouse. I'm not going to look at any of you. Don't be, don't be saying amen up there, Sherry. I heard you up there. You're probably saying it for him, though, huh? Um, but being self-sufficient and strong-willed, when God needs us um, to let him do something through us, we need to remember that um, when we put other people first, God will always put us first. Amen? And it, sometimes it can, be, it can be trying. In 2 Corinthians 2.14, it says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us diffuses the fragrance of knowledge in every place. Again, using us in those places. In Romans 12, 8, in the, in the, if you put this up in the New Living Translation for me, Sherry, uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, Romans 12, 8, and then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 9. Romans 12, 8 in the New Living Translation reads this way. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. See, David, he just mentioned that, right, when he was talking about, you know, it's not about, it's not about your tithes and your offerings and the amount that you're supposed to give or whoever says you're supposed to give a certain amount, whatever that looks like. It's what God, what's God say to you? You know, what is, what is God telling you? And so generosity comes in so many different forms. Kindness is probably... The, the one thing, and peace, amen? Peace and joy, hallelujah. Anybody have a test this week with joy? I won't make you talk, but you can raise your hand. You had, you had a test with joy? No, nope, nobody? Oh, just me. Okay, well. So I lost my phone. Right, everybody's heart just sank, didn't it? Lost my phone, and... Uh, I can't live without a phone. I got way too much stuff going on. There's all kinds of stuff. So I went down and got me a temporary phone, you know, and I got, got you know, I, I transferred all my information onto my new phone, or so I thought. 
okay? And then come to find out the guy didn't transfer it right, so when I called back, they said, oh, we're so sorry, you lost your 20-year-old phone number, we can't give it to you. And I got so upset. And I just don't, for those that know me, it, it isn't something I just, I don't got time to be upset about anything. I just don't, you know. And so we were discussing. I got a 20-minute rule. If I can't find something, I just quit looking for it, 20 minutes, because I'll just become frustrated, and I don't got time to become frustrated. Because when you become anxious and frustrated and disappointed and all these things, God can't move in us, and we just get, I'm getting all worked up all over again inside. And so I got a little upset with these people on the phone, over my phone. Like three people, because I'm like, I need to talk to a supervisor. I, mean, I, I just did this an hour ago, and you're telling me I can't have my phone. You know, I'm just rah, 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 and, and so I, the next day, one of my employees found my phone. <laughs> Praise the Lord, because everything was on it, so I still got it. Right? I just don't got the phone number anymore. And so then I'm like, okay. And, and then the phone, they transferred me to a, a different cell service. So like I have AT&T. Well, they apparently transferred me to a Verizon cell service somehow. Well, it don't work for nothing. I couldn't even use, I was on my way home. I couldn't use my phone for four hours. I had to drive into Stephenville just to be able to use my telephone because Verizon don't work out there. So I went into Walmart and I told them my sad story. I am just, I, I am. Still working up over this, right? And I get in there, and she says, this is going to take six hours on the phone to get your phone number fixed. Well, they wouldn't do it. They just, they refused to do it. And so I was, I, I walked out of there, and I thought, you know what? I don't need my, I don't need my old phone number. I got a new phone number now, so, you know, got a new phone number. I'm happy all over again. I got my joy and my peace back over a silly thing. But, so I understand, and I, and I, I wasn't, I wasn't real nice. Just saying, I wasn't real nice. <sighs> Hallelujah. If your gift, what is the last thing that God told you? And if you have a gift, so at the end of Romans, uh, if God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. And this is part of my leadership training that a scripture that I stand on every time I make decisions in relationship to employees and, and uh, things for the ministry, for the school, and everywhere else. I take it very seriously. God, I represent my Father in heaven. And being ugly is not a good representation of being my Father in heaven. So whenever the enemy comes in and throws things like that at me, I, I stand up. And I'm like, no. I'll be okay without my 20. Do you know I haven't had a spam call since then? <laughs> the silver lining, there's always one. Hallelujah. I'm sure they'll find me, but uh, anyway. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. And so this is an amazing scripture for us to take with me through, with you through the holidays as well. And so 2 Corinthians 9, verses 1 through 15 He starts out, I need to turn there, excuse me. I guess if I'm going to tell you, I should turn there too. 2 Corinthians 9. There it is. So again, I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation for those that are following along. <clears throat> So at the, at the top of the uh, paragraph here, it says administering the gift. I really don't need to write to you, he says, about this ministry of giving for believers in Jerusalem. For I know how eager you are to help. And I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was with enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. You know, when you, when you spread kindness, when you, when you show joy, when you give grace, when grace isn't deserved, and mercy, when mercy isn't something you feel like giving, when you give that, those gifts, 
it changes the spirit within people. And you may not recognize it right at first, but every time we minister the word to people, the Bible says that my word will not return void. And so when you do what God, when you know what you should be doing for God and with God, and you do that, it will change their lives. Because you'll deposit a seed inside them, even if at the moment you don't see it, that God will send somebody else to water. And it will grow. He says, but I'm sending these brothers to be sure you really are ready. As I have been telling them that your money is all collected, I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed not to mention of your own embarrassment if the Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all I had told them. And so we realize here that he's talking about a financial transaction that is taking place. But if you have applied the word enough in your life, you realize that this transfers over into every area that we have, every area that we, that, that we are. I never want... And I've heard people say it. I wouldn't do business, I, people in the world, I wouldn't do business with a Christian. Last time I did a business with a Christian, they took advantage of me. You know, and um, that sort of stuff just makes my heart so sad for them. You know, but I, I never want to be that reflection. I don't want to be that person that somebody said, oh yeah, well, yeah, she come in, she come in here ranting and raving about her phone. <laughs> and she's a, She's a preacher, right? So, you know, I, but inside I was screaming. Outside I, was, I started crying because that's what happens when I get really upset. When I get mad, I cry, right? So I immediately just put the phone down and I just walked out because I was fixing to get not happy and not making everybody else happy. And, and it just, it, it didn't matter, Right? So our stuff, 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 will God, God will give you new stuff. Amen? My phone was just laying out there on the side of the road. I put it on top of the car. I'd taken one of my employees. She couldn't get a ride home. Her husband had fell asleep and forgot to turn his phone on, and he, he comes and picks her up from work. And so I drove up, and I'd put her, I said, well, let me clean out the front seat of my car so you can get in. And I'd put my phone on top of the car. So when I drove out the driveway, it just, you know, flew off. You know? But... You know, even if, and, and, and at the moment that I was so aggravated over this whole thing anyway, I thought, you know what, it'll be okay. I'll, I'll find me a Samsung dealer and they'll, I back up my phone. So they'll transfer all my data, life will be okay, right? And I just started ministering to myself. Sometimes we got to encourage ourselves. Amen? Yeah, encourage yourself. That's an expensive little phone. It's like, I don't need that expensive phone. I didn't buy it anyway, David did, you know, so... <laughs> Um, because I wouldn't have bought that expensive phone, okay? I, I'm just fine with the, you know, regular old, you know, little Android. I have an Android anyway, right? But um, I really did. I don't, I don't ever want to embarrass them. And so when I thought about this, you know, we talk about that we're Christians, and churches talk about, and I've had, I've had more people come in, even here at Silverado Cowboy Church. I remember when we first started when we, we were the only cowboy church in the county. And there's a whole bunch of us, praise the Lord. Can't have too many churches. Um, but I remember people coming in and telling me that they weren't welcome at the local church. And I'm not going to say the denomination or the church. Because they came in and they had on boots and jeans. And they didn't own anything else. But you know, they had a nice shirt on. But they apparently weren't. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I'd never heard. You know, when I got in the ministry and I started hearing stories about how Religion in churches has treated people over the years. We, we really made it, we, we wanted to make a difference. And, and David and I were determined 27 years ago to make a difference in Western ministry. And we started hooking up with people that had that same vision. And uh, now we look out and we see, you know, 500 cowboy churches you know, when we first started with the Fellowship of Christian Cowboys, of Christian athletes, actually, way back when, um, and they started developing cowboy ministry, um, it, just, it just wasn't something, you know. And I love to tell the story, so I'm going to tell it again. 
Fonda and Scott, they'd come with us, and Fonda gets saved every service, so somebody gets saved. <laughs> and sometimes they were the only people that came to church that day, but that's okay. So when David talks about it, and we talk about it, and we, we show up at church, and it's 25 degrees outside. And people are coming in with their Bibles and their saddle blankets and they're sitting on, in the arena because they know they need the word. That blesses me to know that God and honored that God would use me in that place. I'm honored today to just share this message with you. That you came today and you, I hope that you have heard a word that has encouraged you and changed and will edify you and give you a place to be able to minister this week goes on to say, remember this, a farmer who plants, I'm going to go back to verse 5 and repeat that, I'm not sure if I did, so I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready, but I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. It's a very important thing because the enemy will pressure you. And if I'm being pressured, if I feel like I'm being pressured in a decision, and usually, it, I mean, it can be as easy as helping someone. You know, you, you have somebody that has a need and, and all of a sudden you're like feeling like, well, maybe I should help them. Ask the Lord. Maybe, maybe you're not the person that's supposed to help them. Maybe it's somebody else that's supposed to help them. You just, because if I feel pressured, I won't, I won't do anything. And uh, he says, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Right? And so this, this, is, this, this, this scripture within this and within this message, and we're going to finish up at verse 15, um, I think is a great message for the Christmas holiday season and the new year. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. What a Christmas message. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ and they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace has given to you. Thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. Isn't that beautiful? It is, it's beautiful. Let's stand. Hallelujah. John 10, 1 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same way as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A couple weeks ago, David had ministered on this one scripture. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This week, you will have an opportunity. There will be people that will be put before you that do not have a relationship with God. I don't mean know who he is, but don't have a relationship with him. And that's what it's about, right? It's about relationship. When God looked for Adam, he just wanted to continue that relationship with Adam. And there are people out there everywhere we go, every single day, 
that do not have the kind of relationship that we've been talking about today. It says that um, narrow, afraid is the gate, but narrow is what? Narrow is great. I have to find scripture. All right, you know what I'm talking about. So, you know, wide is the way to destruction, but narrow. And so a lot of times I've heard that ministered that there's a very small area that people have to go through. I think it's focus. I think that that small area to go through is the area in the world that is vast, that the enemy has out there and is throwing to people. There's so much of it. When, when we focus on the things of God, it's clear. That path is clear. It's straight. It may be a little bitty gate, but it's open. And it's easy to see that that is the only way that they should be going. Amen? And so take that with you this week. If, um, if you have a need, whatever that need is, Several of us hang out here, come up for prayer. We'd love to pray with you if you need something. If you don't know, um, if your relationship isn't where it should be, stay and let me minister with you and pray with you so that the ways of the world will not be such a great focus for you. Amen, but just the things of God. Oh, Matthew 7, 13. Enter the narrow gate, for wide is the gate. And broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which reads, leads to life. And there are few who find it. So that's the scripture. But again, I, I realize that how it presents itself is that it's a difficult one. But it's really easy. Because he's got all of us helping all these people to the right path. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. And that w the word is alive, and the word is in us. And we will not be led by the ways of destruction, Father. We will always see, every person in here today will always see when it is the enemy that has put something before them, and they will not be deceived. Because the truth of the word is in us, and the Holy Spirit is guiding us on that path every day. And we thank you for it, Father. Move on hearts, people, of the people that hear this message in the future, whether it's by internet or television, that they know that there are people that are praying for them and watching over them, and that some of those people are us. And we, we are honored, Father, to be used for the kingdom. And we give of ourselves this week, Father. Use us how you need us to be used. Speak to us. But more importantly, Father, that we will listen and be obedient to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as you've watched the, the broadcast, uh, you need to know that uh, God loves you and cares about you. I hope today that as you listen to this, you'll see that his plan for you is to succeed in everything that you do. Anytime we look at the Word, we realize that the Word, uh, when it, it comes alive inside of us, that we begin to get what it says. As we get what it says in us, then we become victors in life. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today I hope that you'll make that change. Paul said this, he said that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we'll be saved. For with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the heart one believes unto righteousness. And what that means to you is all you do is you say, Jesus is the Lord of my life. I believe that God raised him from the dead. Now that can't be just something you say with your mouth. You have to, you have to believe it in your heart. You have to know that God loves you and cares about you. Because that's the truth. That'll make your eternal destination heaven. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That life was Zoe means the God kind of life. And I want you to have that today. I want you to know that that will cause you to rise to a new level. 
For those of you that are believers that have been watching this, uh, for any of you, and if you made a change today, make sure you write to us on that uh, address and website that you're going to see in just a minute so that we can send you some stuff. We're excited that God came alive inside of you. If you're believers and or somebody that wants to give tithes and offerings today, there's a button right there on that website that says tithes and offerings. Uh, one of the websites, if you're on it, it says donate. Just push that button. It gives you the opportunity to give to the ministry, realizing that you're putting good uh, seed in good soil that is plowed, is fertilized, and watered, and I expect you'll receive a crop. I want to pray over you right now. Father, I thank you for those that made a decision today to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Father, for those that give, I ask you to give back to them, pressed down, shaken together, and running over to make room for more. And Father, we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus and by his blood. Amen. Remember, Jesus loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord.